Friends, good afternoon. Welcome again. We have uh, come to the climax of our program with the final, <laughs> final keynote. <laughs> no pressure, Matt. <laughs> um, one quick announcement that was on my mind. Um, if I could remember what it was exactly now, I guess it wasn't all that important. Um, oh, yes. Uh, I am very interested in getting your uh, feedback on the conference. And there are a couple of ways you could go about that. One would simply be to drop me an email, Martin P R M A R T E N P R at nd.edu. And or we will be sending out a link to a survey monkey evaluation form the way we did last year. So expect in probably in the fairly near future an invitation to go online and uh, fill out the evaluation form on SurveyMonkey, okay? Um, that's very helpful to get your thoughts on an event like this, so I hope that you will take the time to do that. Let me introduce to you Dr. Tim Madavina, a member of our Department of Theology and also the Executive Director of the Institute for Latino Studies. Uh, and one of our uh, workshop presenters at this conference, Tim will introduce our final keynote speaker. Hi, good afternoon, and thanks for being at the last session. I want to congratulate Mike. He did another great job on this conference at the end of it. And, and thanks to all of you, it's, it's really impressive when you get together with people that have been out in the trenches a long time and have the conversations we've had. So very grateful to everyone, as I know Mike is too. Our speaker for the final session is J. Matthew Ashley, who has served in virtually every leadership position I can think of in the Department of Theology at this university and is currently the chair of the department. And I say that with great affection. Um, the Department of Theology here is a very big department. You don't always get a lot of credit for the behind the scenes work of running programs. Matt is what we call in Spanish someone who is muy servicial. He's the guy who shows up and gets the job done. That's why they keep giving him jobs to do, because he gets the jobs done. Uh, but having that department function so well, as Matt has done through a number of leadership positions, makes a big difference for a place like Notre Dame and for the theological work that's done that influences this campus and places beyond. Uh, so I want to say that in the beginning. Matt uh, would have an even longer list of books and accomplishments if he wasn't spending all of his time answering emails and doing all the things he does that make this place get better and better year by year. So we're all very appreciative to, to his leadership. Uh, he studied for his PhD at the University of Chicago Divinity School, very prestigious degree, where he studied with the likes of David Tracy and other luminaries who have influenced his work. And before that, the Western Jesuit School of Theology in Massachusetts. So he's got a lot of scholarly interests, but uh, some of the main ones, science and theology, very important concern uh, for the world these days, uh, political and liberation theologies, and Christian spirituality. Uh, Matt's directed a number of very fine theses. I was brought to this place to work more with the theologians who do Latino theology, and he's actually directed the theses of some of our brightest young students in that area who have gone on to do great things elsewhere at Boston College, Fordham, and other universities. So his books include Interruptions, Mysticism, Politics, and Theology in the work of Johann Baptist Metz, on whom he's an expert, the great theology of Metz. And most recently, his uh, published lecture from Mar at Marquette, Take Lord and Receive All My Memory Toward an, anamnest uh, an Anamnestic Mysticism. He also held, uh, formerly, the Henry Luce Fellowship in Theology, uh, this is the highest fellowship that one can hold in theology in this country, uh, the, kind of the most distinguished awards, kind of like the Academy Award of Theologians, if there is such a thing. So that's very distinguished. And he's published a number of articles in journals that theologians in the crowd and others will recognize, the most distinguished ones, Theological Studies, Horizons, Spiritus, Journal of Christian Spirituality, and Concilium. One of his essays, Reading the Universe Story Theologically, the contrib contribu contribu contribution of a biblical narrative imagination won the 2010 Best Article Award uh, from the College Theology Society. You should get, get that one back out now that the Pope has written an encyclical on 
you know, the theology of the cosmos, of the universe, and of nature and creation and so on. So Matt's got many, many accomplishments, but above all, he's a great friend and colleague, and I think you're going to find his comments today not only deeply theological, but also very applicable to the many ministries and services and leadership that we all provide. Matt, congratulations on what you're to present, and welcome. Thanks, Tim, for that very kind introduction. Um, although your point about having served every uh, administrative post in the department made me think that people are going to say, oh, yeah, uh, Mike Connors chose a real nutcase for the final <laughs> presentation. But it's a pleasure to be here, and, uh, and this conference has been a joy for me. Um, and I realize now that we've come to the end of a very rich conference together, and most of the good lines have already been taken. And um, we're all probably looking forward to our final liturgy and transitioning back towards home or maybe vacation. I know Mike is looking forward to vacation. Um, so I want to thank uh, speakers who have preceded me, particularly Archbishop Tobin and Edward Honenberg, since they basically said everything that I had intended to say and said it better. Uh, Ed even stole my intro that uh, everyone before had stolen his best ideas. So thanks a lot, Ed, wherever you are. Um, Seriously, uh, I remember teaching Ed as a doctoral student in the 1990s, and um, there are few, uh, few experiences more rewarding for a teacher than being upstaged by your student, and so um, I'm grateful to him. If I'm going to retrieve any benefit from going last, it will be by building on the foundation uh, laid by those who've gone before me, particularly on uh, looking at Pope Francis in terms of the theme of the conference. <clears throat> and try to pull together some questions and issues that I've heard. Um, that is, I get to steal back from them, as you'll see in a moment. Um, I'll start by saying a little bit of how I want to approach the theme. It is, after all, a huge topic, and we could go on for hours and hours, but I'm not going to do that. Um, and as Ed already said, I'm going to be looking at this as a theologian systematic and academic theologian, not as someone who preaches, which I don't, except maybe when running faculty meetings, um, but as one of the baptized sitting in the pews. But one who has had the great privilege, and this I do count to my theological education, of learning that something really amazing happened when he was a young lad memorizing Latin mass prayers in the early 60s so that he could serve as an altar boy at St. Patrick's Catholic Church. Vatican II happened. And if we reflect and celebrate on these documents that appeared 50 years ago, it is because they set a course for the church, a course that we are on the way to becoming a church that the Holy Spirit has called us to be. I love Ed's PowerPoint slide, which I then stole from him, contrasting the skyscraper, and the medieval cathedral. I told you I'd steal, and I'm going to come back to this even one more time later on. So at least I was make, made him feel guilty enough that he sent me his PowerPoint presentation. But the journey has been a rocky one and a difficult one. And being still on the way, we are all together in the somewhat anxious situation of living in between a church that many of us only dimly remember and growing numbers of our fellow Christians don't remember at all, and a church that we can only see through a glass darkly. So one approach that I want to take to our topic is to look at the legacy and challenges of the council by seeing Pope Francis's papacy as a sort of a barometer for where we are, or a milepost marker, if you will. But I think this might, I hope, have something to do with good preaching. So let me propose to you that, among other things, good preaching gives people hope for the journey. And that's why it's worthwhile for those of you to preach who take, to take stock of where we are on that journey, as I will suggest it to you by looking at Pope Francis's papacy. Let me propose to you, second, that the extraordinary impact that Pope Francis has had derives in good part from the fact that he is giving the church as a whole hope for the journey. He is able to do this, I propose, thirdly, 
because he both understands the council and he understands the people. He smells of the sheep, as he famously remarked when talking about a good bishop. So a good preacher should smell of the sheep. Now, smelling of the sheep doesn't mean just hanging around with them and rubbing up against the wool. It means understanding them, which takes prayer, empathy, and thought. And yes, sometimes, not always, but sometimes ivory tower academics can help us in the thought department, maybe not so much in the empathy and the prayer department. But I do think Pope Francis has given a great deal of thought to the situation on the ch of the church on its journey toward being the church of Vatican II, envisioned 50 years ago in Rome. And so what I would like to do to kind of try and reflect with you my uh, thoughts on the theme of the conference is to see what we can learn from him about what we share as baptized Christians living on the way, and also what it might mean to preach to give hope to a church that's on the way. Now, lots could be said and has already been written about Francis's preaching and about how his actions have been calculated to give hope. Just the fact that he radiates joy and peace, the fact that he has heeded his own advice that, quote, an evangelizer should never look like someone who has just come back from a funeral. Um, not bad preaching advice either, I guess. Earlier today, Ed gave us uh, nice basic principles on preaching that he drew from Francis. Preaching from below, from a prayerful immersion in the people, accompanying the people, another important principle of the Latin American Bishops' Conference, the accompaniento, that we're not above or outside of the people, we accompany them. And finally, preaching that is from and directs toward the peripheries. That's all really good. I don't have any improvement on that. But I thought what I would do would be to start from Ed's nice point, I thought, about a shift in universities. So now I'm on terrain. I feel a little more comfortable about. Right? From talking about instructors teaching to talking about student learning. It is just as important, Ed suggested, to look at the qualities of a student community, community of learners, that is receptive to good teaching, as it is to look at the expertise of the instructor. So that in good teachers learn how to build good communities who are receptive of good teaching. And I was thinking, gee, that seems to me to be true someone who doesn't know very much at all about homiletics, but it seemed to me uh, likely to be true about preaching as well, right? Isn't building a community of missionary disciples an important element in successful preaching? Francis is very concerned about building such a community, as I think was evident from Ed's talk and from Archbishop Tobin's talk on Monday. And so I want to look about so, at some principles that Francis has articulated. To guide the formation of a community of missionary disciples, which will be a community that can hear good preaching and maybe even elicit it from those of us who are tasked with that preaching. You probably know that Oscar Romero once famously said that with this people, it is not difficult to be a good pastor. Might we not think about the work of building up a community of missionary disciples so that it's not difficult or at least not as difficult to be a good preacher? And I think that's something that we're all charged with in the various tasks that we fulfill within the church as teachers, scholars, pastors, homilists, lay ecclesial ministers, or even administrators. We are called to cooperate in building a community of missionary disciples who will, as Francis has also said, with his wonderful biblical imagination, recognize the voice of the shepherd. Francis worked hard on this, and he learned from his mistakes as provincial and local superior of the Jesuits in Argentina, and then as auxiliary bishop and archbishop in Buenos Aires. He did it in difficult times in that country's history. Dictatorship, dirty war, rampant corruption, in which the church was deeply entangled, and economic collapse. You might recall in this regard the difficulty of negotiating that from Archbishop Tobin's remarks about his experience about visiting a redemptorist community in Chile but difficult times in the church, 
this pope is the first one to have been ordained after the close of the council. During the council years, he was finishing his first studies and teaching high school, of all things. The high school teaches one. Francis has experienced the struggle to carry the council forward as someone who came to his full formation as a religious and as a leader after it was complete. But he rose to prominence because he was so successful and instrumental in the Latin American church's attempt to appropriate Vatican II, Gaudium et Spes in particular, I would say, for itself. Evident in his work at the most recent meeting of the Latin American bishops that Ed talked about at Aparecida. And now he's trying to do the same for the universal church. Now, Francis has given us a short summary of his principles for building such a community in his apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Gaudium, paragraphs 222 to 237. He gives these principles on a section devoted to, quote, the building of a people where differences are harmonized within a common pursuit. Or, to put it another way, recalling Archbishop Tobin's talk, this is one in which embodies a culture of encounter, one in which we meet in our differences, even a difference as dramatic as that between theist and atheist, in a common effort to do good. As his biographer, Austin Ivere, points out, Bergoglio formulated these four rather abstruse sounding principles from an eclectic set of sources, including Ignatian spirituality, a variety of Latin American and uh, European intellectuals, but most of all from his own experience. I'm going to suggest that each of these principles encapsulates a way that Francis has adopted, taken up the legacy and the challenge of a council in a world church. Aiming toward a church of missionary disciples in which it might be less difficult to be a good preacher. And so it intersects with the principles that Ed proposed. So in addition to Evangelia Gaudium, I will also use Francis's just issued encyclical on the environment, Laudato Si, as an illustration of how Pope Francis has put these principles into practice to give the church hope for the journey. So first, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. For Francis, our road forward must navigate a tension between globalization and localization. This was already evident at the Second Vatican Council, which, as you know, was the first really global ecumenical council. One of the tacit or perhaps not intended results of the council was a growing awareness of the different needs and gifts of the great regional churches, like the Church of Latin America. An awareness that, encouraged by Paul VI, led to the foundation or the strengthening of regional bishops' conferences, such as what is now the USCCB, but also the Latin American Bishops' Conference, or CELAM. Now, this led to some difficult questions on the relationship, for instance, of the teachings of these regional groups of bishops, intermediate between the local bishop and the pope, and uh, what came out of Rome. Now, um, on this, this question, the earlier popes, particularly John Paul II and Benedict, took a decisive option for the center for Rome. Uh, for example, within Cardinal Ratzinger's approval, John Paul II issued a motu proprio in 1998, Apostolo Suos, which denied that the teachings of regional conferences shared in any way in the work of the magisterium. Now, Francis, in one of his little gentle revolutions, clearly thinks that this denies the contribution of the parts to the whole. In Evangelii Gaudium, he states that, quote, it is not advisable for the pope to take the place of local bishops in the discernment of every issue that arises in their territory. And if you read through Laudato Si, you will find many, many references to documents of regional bishops' conferences the USCCB, Ceylon, but also the bishops of the Philippines, of Southern Africa, of Bolivia, and of Germany. He also quotes extensively from the so-called Green Patriarch, Bartholomew, Ecumenical Patriarch of Constantinople. So the whole is greater than the parts, takes us back to Max Johnson's keynote yesterday, in which the whole is made up of all the baptized. But he goes even farther because there's an amazing footnote in which he quotes 
a ninth century Muslim mystic and poet, Ali al Khawas. So you get the drift. This principle asserts that working within communities, we have to be attentive to the global context to avoid, to avoid banality and narrowness while keeping our feet firmly grounded in the local context so that we continue to smell of the sheep. Quote, the global need not stifle, nor the particular prove barren. Within our communities, we have to realize that they are holes made up of parts that have their unique contributions to make. With his penchant for metaphor, Francis proposes that we imagine the church, and I think that's both the universal church, but also local churches in which we serve, not so much as a sphere with all points equally distanced to a center against which everything is measured and oriented, but a polyhedron. By the way, he says polyhedron, this is the old geometry teacher, not a regular polyhedron necessarily, right? Um, because then you really get the sphere in another way, but kind of an interesting kind of blobby thing like this thing that I found. So that the different parts are like different planes of the polyhedron with different sizes and angles and contributions that give the whole its beauty and its richness. Everyone has something to offer. And our task as those who are trying to build up a church of missionary disciples is to draw in this harvest. First and foremost for Francis by attending to the poor and to those marginalized persons to whom we relatively privileged members of society habitually pay little or no attention. Who can deny that we can learn and must learn from and preach from the experience of Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in downtown Charleston? Even though this may be, as Ed helpfully reminded us, a learning that involves weeping. And as Francis goes on to write, quote, even people who can be considered dubious on account of their errors, have something to offer which must not be overlooked. So the atheists, the couple in an irregular marriage, gays, lesbians, we can learn from them. They are not outside the whole. This premise, although, once again remembering Archbishop Tobin's remark, is that we are united or striving to be united in, quote, a society which pursues the common good, which truly has a place for everyone. For Francis, this principle has an evangelical basis. He says, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts is based on the totality or integrity of the gospel, which the church passes down to us and sends us forth to proclaim. This is a gospel which blooms in places we might not expect to find it, in people sometimes in articulate prayers, in their struggles, for wholeness and justice in their celebrations. Indeed, in quote, the joys and the hopes, the griefs and the anxieties of the men and women of this age, especially those who are poor or are in any way afflicted, as Gaudium et says, begins. So we might allow Francis to ask us, in the communities and institutions we serve and over which we have some charge, where do we look and where do we not look? to harvest the riches of the gospel for the whole community? What part have we overlooked? What part do we need to call our local community to attend to? Second, unity prevails over conflict. Francis has lived his adult faith life in a society and a church riven by conflict. This was true even, and painfully true, of the Jesuits of Argentina, over whom Francis had charge as provincial and then as a local superior of one of the biggest and most important houses in Argentina, Colegio Máximo. Because these communities were divided over how to respond to the call for a renewal of religious life, and that other document promulgated 50 years ago, if I can throw in a fourth one, Perfecte Caritas, on appropriate religious reform, reform of religious life. There are arguments over that, and as well, arguments over how to respond to the poverty and injustice, which had always been present, but was newly highlighted in Latin America by the 1968 conference at Medellin of the Latin American Bishops Conference, and 
Antioch. Bergoglio took an active part in these documents, got caught up in them, and spent two painful years in virtual exile in Argentina while a new province leadership dismantled some of the reforms he had made and took the province in a different direction. It was a purgation for him, a dark night. <clears throat> But he learned from it about the nature of conflict and what it takes to deal with conflict. Now, there can be no doubt at all that there have been deep conflicts, painful ones in the Catholic Church over how to interpret and implement the Council. And this is and should be a source of deep pain for all of us. That what should be a cause for celebration and hope, the work of the Spirit in an ecumenical Council has become a source of division and disillusionment for many. This too is a part of the legacy and challenge of the council 50 years later. Now writing on conflict in this section on this principle, he says that conflict cannot be ignored or concealed, but neither should we come trapped in it. He writes, when conflict arises, some people simply look at it and go on their way as if nothing happened. They wash their hands of it and get on with their lives. Others embrace it in such a way that they become its prisoners. They lose their bearings, project on institutions their own confusion and dissatisfaction, and thus make unity impossible. But there is a third way, and it is the best way to deal with conflict. It is the willingness to face conflict head on, resolve it, and make it a link in a chain of new processes. Blessed are the peacemakers. That's from Evangelii Gaudium 227. <clears throat> In this way, Francis goes on, we can work together toward a reconciled diversity, a term that he took actually from Cardinal Walter Casper's definition of a goal of ecumenical dialogue. Not a bland tolerance of let a thousand flowers bloom or a negotiated settlement between different power blocks. Rather, this is a way, quote, of making history a life setting where conflicts, tensions, and oppositions can achieve diversified and life-giving unity. Now, this might all sound easy and naive, which is why I gave you the early biographical details of Bergoglio's life. He, wa he got this at a cost. <clears throat> he says, first, we need to find reconciliation in our own hearts, quote, in our own lives, ever threatened as they are by fragmentation and breakdown. And this comes from encountering the merciful Christ, as Archbishop reminded us on Monday, perhaps the most pervasive theme in Francis's writings. On this basis, Francis goes on, we see everyone, especially those with whom we disagree, quote, in their deepest dignity, a dignity grounded in our unity and baptism, as Max Johnson reminded us who is made a peace by the blood of his cross. So I might take up a question asked on Monday. How do we preach to and within conflict? I think it's by hearing the exhortations of the gospel. Jesus is, at least in my uh, rather unprofessional count, most pervasive uh, statements. Do not be afraid. Peace be with you. But a peace that, as Francis defines it, is the peace of knowing oneself deeply to be a forgiven sinner who is, as he writes, carried beyond our sins as if we had been liberated from them. This is not cheap advice, and as I said before, it's advice that he learned through suffering. And his recent practice at the Synod on the Family of servicing conflict is evidence of that, as well as his willingness to write an encyclical on the environment that no one is going to be fully happy with. But he keeps lines of communication open while maintaining his position. So I think this is where this principle complements the first one. Because the whole is made up of and is greater than the parts, even the parts represented by our opposition, we are compelled in faith and hope to work on the premise that unity ultimately prevails over conflict. Third, and a good one for academics to remember, realities are more important than ideas. This is, according to Francis, the principle of incarnation and discipleship. It is, quote, the principle of a word already made flesh and striving to take flesh 
anew, I think, in us and in our vocation as baptized to be missionary disciples. As Archbishop Tobin noted again on Monday, Francis begins Evangelii Gaudium with a beautiful quote from the opening of Benedict XVI's encyclical Deus Caritas Est, and I'll repeat it. Being a Christian is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty idea, but the encounter with an event, a person, which gives life a new horizon and a decisive direction. So when Francis talks about reality, he does not mean atoms and molecules arranged this way or that, or historical events strung together in sequences of cause and effect. He means that place where alone we find God, which is not in our heads. Karl Barth used to say that one of the best ways to avoid God was to spend your time thinking about God. And the Jesuit philosopher Ignacio Iacuria added that one of the best ways to avoid reality is to spend all your time thinking about it. Now, thinking is not unimportant, but it must follow upon an engagement with reality. Francis writes that this must mean unmasking the various means of masking reality, angelic forms of purity, dictatorships of relativism, empty rhetoric, objectives that are more ideal than real, brands of ahistorical fundamentalism, ethical systems bereft, of kindness, intellectual discourse bereft of wisdom. Nice pointers for the academic theologian, and I suggest for the preacher too. You can see this principle in Francis's own leadership, and I think this is really what's behind these uh, famous or infamous tendency to make off-the-cuff remarks or make these gestures that break out of the tight scripts that a pope is supposed to run under. Now, to be sure, we now have two long and carefully thought out documents, an apostolic exhortation and an encyclical. But I think his, these remarks and gestures come from an insight that you can't get a grip on reality just by carefully and tightly controlling what you say about it and trying to control what other people think about it. Reality is deeper than that. So that these gestures of his and these remarks mirror the unruliness, the uncontrollability of reality, and challenge us not to see formal doctrinal statements as a replacement for the reality of the gospel. So Francis has always been a realist, or someone immersed in the secular, um, to take up the points that Ed made earlier. But I think it's reality in the sense that I just indicated the point where God has come to dwell among us and continues to dwell among us, or what Ed helpfully indicated in talking about the secular character of the laity. Maybe this sense of reality or the secular is best captured by the well-known poet of Francis's fellow Jesuit, Gerard Manley Hopkins. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil, crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod. All is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil. And wears man's smudge and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. And for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness deep down things. And though the last lights off the black west went, O oh morning at the brown brink is eastward spring because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and ah, bright wings. In short, we are to find God in all things, despite the Ignatian motto. <clears throat> That's reality. This is not an insight or a way of seeing easily attained. And again, reality can afflict us, as Hopkins reminds. Seared, bleared, smeared, even confronting us with crucified peoples, as liberation theologians Ignacio Iacoria and John Sobrino assert. 
The necessity of this kind of attention to reality is, again, the point of Gaudium et Spes and the famous opening lines that I read a little earlier. And it's also behind Francis's call to go to the peripheries, or at least out to what appear to be the peripheries based on the maps and our clever heads we put together. Maps that delineate our comfort space. Maps that precisely locate and cordon off the places where we are accustomed to find God, leaving outside the places where we don't want to go. <clears throat> it is also the principle that keeps the gospel and the church's teaching ever alive and life-giving. This really struck me in Francis's encyclical on the environment, <clears throat> in which he not only pulled together the church's social teachings, but stretches it by going out to find God in a place in reality where until recently, except for a few random saints like Francis of Assisi, we have seldom thought to find God. Francis writes in 243 of Laudato Si, at the end, we will find ourselves face to face with the infinite beauty of God and be able to read with admiration and happiness the mystery of the universe the universe which will share with us an unending plenitude. So yes, Fido will go to heaven, as will all of us, we hope, but as a part of the whole universe. Reality is indeed, in this light, more important than ideas. The whole is indeed greater than the sum of the parts. Deep unity will finally encompass and harmonize conflict. Time is greater than space. Now, this one took me a long time because it's kind of the most puzzling of his principles. And it's also one that begins showing up later. He used to have three. He came up with four after he finished being provincial in Argentina, perhaps rearing what he had learned in that difficult work of trying to be true to the principle of unity prevails over conflict. He names this principle as coming from, quote, the constant tension between fullness and limitation. Technically speaking, this is about eschatology, the already but the not yet of God's presence in our world, of God's kingdom. Broadly speaking, Francis writes, time has to do with fullness as an expression of a horizon which constantly opens up before us, while each individual moment has to do with limitation as an expression of enclosure, of defining a space. People live poised between each individual moment and the greater, brighter horizon of that utopian future as the final cause which draws us to itself. Both of these are real. Our efforts now are always limited. We lay only a few stones in that great cathedral that Ed talked about. But we contribute to a work of the spirit that extends in time beyond us and calls us to be patient. Giving priority to space, Francis continues, means madly trying to keep everything together in the present, trying to possess the spaces of power and of self-assertion. It is to crystallize processes, freeze them, and presume to hold them back. Giving priority to time, means being concerned about initiating processes rather than possessing spaces. What we need then is to give priority to actions which generate new processes in society, engage other people and groups who can develop them to the point where they can bear fruit in significant historical events. Now, I struggled with this one a lot, but then I got it. Um, he's talking about turf wars. How many of you have tried to initiate some new program project or plan, only to be stymied by others who have to protect their turf, hold on to their space, because that's where they have their power and their self-assertion and they can't give it up. Or how many times do we, do I, initiate a process and then need to decide that I have to control it completely, wall it in, keep it from wandering out of the imaginary space that I have set for it in my mind, Realities are more important than ideas. This is connected to these other principles. 
The whole is greater than the sum of the parts in a way that I cannot ultimately understand in advance. Reality is greater than ideas, even my best ideas. For Francis, this allows us to take the long view and to find hope without having to be obsessed with immediate results, to endure setbacks and inevitable changes in plans. As Francis notes in this section, Jesus warned the disciples that there were things that they did not yet understand and that they would have to wait for the Holy Spirit before they did. Referring to one of his favorite parables in Matthew 13, he talks about how we plant seeds and the wheat springs up, but then an enemy comes and plants weeds. Our task is not to rip out the weeds, but to care for the wheat in the trust that over the long haul, quote, the goodness of the wheat will prevail. Maybe this principle is behind his infamous remark, who am I to judge? Now this principle dovetails with the point Ed made earlier, so I stole his picture again, um, about the, count, the council is not the building of a skyscraper whose plan we already have at hand, but a patient toiling away at a cathedral that will take generations to complete. This reminds me of a prayer that you probably have heard. It's often attributed to Oscar Romero, but it was really written in Romero's honor by Ken Untner, Bishop of Saginaw. We cannot do everything, and there is a sense of liberation in realizing that. This enables us to do something and to do it well. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning, a step along the way, an opportunity for the Lord's grace to enter and do the rest. We may never see the end results, but that is the difference between the master builder and the worker. We are workers, not master builders. Ministers, not messiahs. We are prophets of a future, not our own. <clears throat> this principle, too, is eminently present in Laudato Si. Francis is uncompromisingly critical of our current unsustainable way of life, and he calls for radical change in political policy, economic practice, and technological manipulation regarding the environment. Yet, also, and it's this both and that makes the encyclical sometimes unsatisfying to different scribes, and inspired by Therese of Lisieux and her little way of love, he insists on little acts of asceticism, renunciation, sacrifice, and generosity when it comes to, quote, our common home. They may not have spectacular results all at once in the here and now. They do not take up a lot of space. They don't get a lot of news. But they are crucial, Francis insists, for an ecological conversion and an ecological spirituality. They do make a difference, but only for someone for whom time is greater than space. <coughs> And speaking personally as someone who is taught on the environment, the priority of time over space gives hope. In the face of a catastrophe that seems to be unstoppable, there are things that are in our power to do, even though they are difficult and involve renunciation. That gives hope. I think the application to preaching is not too difficult to discern. Yes, be challenging, as Francis is in this encyclical, but to recall his admonitions under the principle that realities are more important than ideas, don't preach objectives that are more ideal than real or ethical systems bereft of kindness. Almost done. <clears throat> the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Unity prevails over conflict. Realities are more important than ideas. Time is greater than space. These are principles that Francis has learned in a long career of trying to come to grips with the legacy and challenges of the council in a global church. They are principles of discernment that he proposes for the building of a people where differences are harmonized within a common pursuit. Which is the way that missionary disciples realize their mission to make of the church a leaven in our world? They're not a cookbook recipe either for pastoral administration, good teaching, or good preaching. They better not be. <clears throat> but they're principles of discernment. 
which for those of you familiar with the history of Christian spirituality as a whole and Ignatian spirituality in particular, is a very precise kind of spiritual practice and art. They are principles that govern how Francis is understood and shoulder the legacy and challenges of the council 50 years later. I think they intersect fruitfully, and this is what I was thinking about uh, between Ed's talk and my own, but maybe you can think of other connections between the principles that Ed proposed earlier in talking about preaching, so getting three principles of preaching from a different avenue. So I thought, preaching begins from below. Realities are more important than ideas. Preaching from within a people accompanying them on the way. Time is greater than space. Preaching from and toward the peripheries, even the peripheries where there's conflict and suffering. The sum is greater than the whole apart. Harmony prevails over conflict. You could probably think of other ones. So I suppose what I might be leaving those of you with, who unlike me are called to preach, is good news and bad news. Good news is take heart, it's not all your fault. All the good homiletical technique in the world will not reach a community that has not developed fully enough so that it can recognize the voice of the shepherd. You can appropriate for yourself Francis's insight that time is greater than space. Instead of waiting around until you occupy some imaginary space that defines the perfect preacher, armed with all the best ideas, you can make a beginning now, initiate processes, plant seeds. Bad news, or challenging news. <clears throat> I would also think that the task of a preacher using principles of discernment like this is to stretch the community to which you are preaching. Discerning, that word again, and calling that community in small ways to a reality that is greater than what they think right now, but not doing that in a way that you propose ideals more, uh, principles more ideal than objective. Now that's not easy to do, but I don't have to do it. Calling people out of their comfort zone realizing maybe that they might be further along than you think they are. Not easy work. It requires, again, these principles. Preaching from below. Preaching from within the community, smelling like the sheep. Preaching from and toward the periphery. The task for all of us, I think, is to look at the decisions we make and our different works in the church. The things we write, the decisions we make, the example we give, and see if we might do a better job of moving the transition toward a community of missionary disciples. To the extent that you can do this as preachers, and thank you, thank you, I know it's hard, and the extent to those of us who struggle in other ministries to build a community of missionary disciples, we can give each other encouragement and hope for the journey. And this, much more than any lecture that I can give you, is the best way to take up the legacy and challenge of the council in the global church. Thank you. Thank you.